Wow. Boy, we're on the air already. Fix yourself up and make sure you're perfect. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yep, that's the part. <laughs> you have any powder in my nose? <laughs> Here comes Gwen. Well, hello, Gwen. Well, she Hi, hasn't Gwen. she hasn't uh, unmuted herself yet, or we can't see her yet. Here she comes. Hi. Gwen, good, morning. good morning. Good morning. We can hear you loud and clear. Clear. Can you hear us? It's so nice to hear clearly when we have class. Oh, hi, Gwen. Hi. You want to see everybody, Gwen? I'll, I'll yeah, do a span. Okay. I'll do a span. Say hello to hi. Gwen. Hi. Oh, hi, Judy. Hello, hi. hello, Gwen. Hi, Bill. Hi, Mr. Peter. <laughs> Peter the Rock. Hi, Marilyn. Wee. Yay. Hi, sweetie. Hi, hi, Amy. And hi, baby. There's the baby right there with the red hair. And there's, <laughs> there's Justin. <laughs> Scout. There we go. There we go. Wonderful. <laughs> I think we're waiting for um, anyone else to. Uh, I think Mary Ann's coming. Well, Mary Ann Wong did say she was coming. Oh, nice. On. Oh. I told Mary, yeah, Mary Ann came on from the service, and uh, yeah, yes. I, I hopefully, yeah, she gets, usually Nancy pops on. Yeah, yes, she yes, explained to me. Uh, she's got to have to rush around this afternoon. <laughs> Maybe she'll relax at the clay. Who uh, who hasn't received their resident theologian sticker? Marilyn. Well, <laughs> now you got it. You're taking part in our. Does it work when you see study? and able to get? We'll save one officer. for you, Gwen. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, what does this get me? Which one would you like? I don't think Bill was here to get one. Gwen, how are you feeling? You were online. Um, I fell, so it's been a rough week, and um, I'm still recovering from the bloat, broke a toe. Oh. oh. What did she yeah. Want? Well, you hang in there. Thank you. I miss you. I don't like that. Oh, I miss seeing you guys. We have such good classes, and when we're in person, it's even better. But at least now we can we can we can hear you, and you can hear us, and that's good. Yes. Yeah. Well, I've got a new. I got speakers, and I've got another microphone that I'm using. I'm using a micro new microphone in church also. So hope. It well, I'm hoping we can get grant money so that you can have all the equipment you need, Peter. Yeah, the problem we're we're trying trying to actually hook into the the audio box at church, but yes. the headphone that we 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 link into, we I've got the the equipment to do it, and it's not working. So I've got somebody looking into the system to see if there's a dummy switch on the back of it we have to flip or something and if i can do that then then basically you'll get directly from the speaker from the from the microphone that like pastor donald's speaking into goes directly to you instead of having to you know right now i've got a new microphone which in the last few weeks which hopefully is better but yes, it's still it, pick, it still picks up some of the um it's it's getting it second hand from the main speaker and if there's people talking or if there's another noise and i've also moved to the other side in the last month because that other side is a little chatty my mother's on that other side and you know <laughs> you know she's always talking no way and i'll throw amy under the bus too she's a she's a chat master too oh, boy, we're like the, oh, oh i'm sitting oh. on <laughs> Wait till you hear that we met Sally. And nobody yeah. else did. So ha 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 ha. I knew that was coming. <laughs> they have so you much happiness. Over there. I think I'm, I, you, you distract me a lot. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm going to have to concentrate. Oh, Your son don't talk to me. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we know that's not true. I know it's not true. 
Now I can focus. Okay, now we now you you now have you can the, go on now. You have the floor, Pastor. Okay. Well, I really don't get it. I gave up that idea a couple of weeks ago. Good for you. Yep. You realize you're just along for the ride. <laughs> I don't fall off. It gets bumpy sometimes. Right. Uh, it's good to see all in a good way. Remember, we are all ministers. That's yes. right. Yes. Praise the Lord. Beth taught Amen. us that well. Yes, she did. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming out again today. This is our fourth week together, I believe. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> and we got started with Paul. We've been to see Peter and listen to what they have to say. We heard from the Gospel of Mark last week, and this week we're going to look into what Matthew says. Uh, I couldn't find an appropriate liturgy to open our study today, so I just photocopied one we used a week or two ago, two weeks ago. So why don't we take time, if you find your copy, I'm sorry I didn't get it to this young man over here, Gwen. It's to get it up on email. Uh, oh, it's in her email. So. It's in your email, Justin. Get it like that. <laughs> because he is a victim of what he told me. On his phone, he's on the internet, he's got his email right there. We want him to think about us on the way to Vietnam. <laughs> That's a long trip. He's going to be lots of thoughts. <laughs> Honestly, that reminded me of so many experiences in my career of being at uh, seminars or a webinar or where someone is speaking, even at sermons, myself, honor the time you commit, honor the time that we're together, turn it off. I mean, I've been at the most uh, exciting or interesting lectures and some, oh, oh, I have my phone. And they jump up and they run out of the room mm -hmm. two or three times. And I'm thinking, <laughs> why didn't you bother coming? Yeah. Honor the time that you put in. So uh, Nobody calls me, so you. I'm all right. <laughs> See, you scared her to death. Oh, did I? <laughs> Poor Sandy's fuddling. Her, 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 her. Wait, wait, Nobody wait, calls wait. her, but yet just in case. <laughs> Well, the lesson's on my phone, so I could look at you guys. Well, oh, that's you go. good. That is an appropriate yeah. use of it. But imagine <laughs> a, a the symphony where, in the middle of the dramatic, soft music, someone's phone comes on. How the audience? Well, the Lord be with you. And also oh, with, with you. you. Lift up your hearts. We you lift them, them up to the Lord. Lord. I don't have it. Thanks to the Lord our God. It, it is, is right, right to give our thanks and praise. praise. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, O Lord our God, creator and ruler of the universe. You establish, establish your church to testify to the power of Christ's resurrection. A people, people of one heart and soul holding everything in common, sharing their abundance with the poor. You are the God of our ancestors, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You spoke through your prophets of the Messiah, who would come to suffer so that all might repent and be delivered from sin. You are our shepherd, O Lord, and in you there is nothing we lack. You lead us to green pastures, still waters. You restore our souls. You prepare a table before us. Our cup overflows. All the ends of the earth turn to you and worship you, O Lord. The poor eat and they are satisfied. Those who seek you praise your name. Even those who sleep in the dust bow down before you. The, the sea roars, the floods clap their hands, the hills sing together for joy, 
for you judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. All the ends of the earth have seen your victory. You watch over the faithful, O Lord, those who keep your word. They are like trees planted by streams of water. They yield fruit in due season and prosper in all things. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with choirs of angels, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and with all the faithful of every time and place, whomever sings to the glory of your name. We'd like to welcome Mary Ann in. Hi, Mary Ann. Good to have you with us. Please uh, be active in, it, in the discussion and any questions, we, we are on speaker and hopefully you can hear us clearly. Yes, I can. Thank you. Oh, good. And we can hear you. Yes. Uh, let me just take a moment and run through this little packet of material I ran off because in our previous classes, you have become such great theologians and scholars yourselves. That's why you got the resident theologian. Uh, you can uh, tape on the back and wear it as a pin if you'd like. You've raised such great questions that came to my mind that you have really broadened our study in so many ways, and you have. Uh, made it go deep into amazing issues. So I, I just had to go back and do some research. You're really making me think above my abilities and my pay grade. <laughs> um, maybe, gotta, maybe your pay grade, but not your abilities. <laughs> so in this little package of five or six extra pages, um, there is a reference in the book of Exodus to the beginning of sacrifice, and we were talking about the sacrificial goat. Uh, oh, that's in the next one, I think, somewhere. But the beginnings of sacrifices, mm. the Passover, uh, the Passover lamb. This is from Exodus chapter 12. You're not going to have time to read it now, but maybe part of your homework. So it speaks about the, the, the theme of the Passover lamb and how they came with the Passover matzah, the unleavened bread, what they had to do with the blood of the lamb and on their doorposts, and raises really important questions of uh, what, what does it mean? Why, why sacrificing animals? Where did that start? And how did that come about? And, and what was the meaning of that? So that was one question that came out, broadening and deeping our, our study of the resurrection. What is the meaning of sacrifice? And then in Leviticus, the great day of forgiveness in chapter 16, there, this is where I think he talks about the goat that, yeah, on the back page, verse 26, mm -hmm. the one who led the goat into the desert and sent it off to the demon, Azazel, or something like that. I, I have a tough time pronouncing these, as you might, uh, and how they had to purify themselves. So that's another topic, clean and unclean. We've got sacrifice. We've got what does it mean to be clean and unclean and holy? And then the whole theme of the Lamb of God. These are just some of the printouts from the use of the Lamb of God in the New Testament. And it surprised me this morning when I went looking at these again. The Gospel of John and the book of Revelation is where it's mostly referred to. 
I, I didn't see it in Matthew or Mark or Luke, the reference to the Lamb of God, but hmm, but yet it's a very popular and and well-known theme now of Jesus as the Lamb of God. So these are just illustrations of how a simple Bible study looking into the witnesses of the resurrection have pushed our thinking. Well, actually, you made me push our thinking into so many other themes, which we are not going to get into right now. We'll be here for hours. Any questions before I push on? Any thoughts? Got, oh, we were talking about, about the theme of the Messiah. Uh, before I get carried away, let me just remind you, we started out looking for these three repeated ideas or themes in Paul in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. We look for these ideas or phrases when Peter's speech in the book of Acts, and we saw them last week in the Gospel of Mark. But we came up with these different uh, descriptions that may change. So we're going to, I just wanted to remind you of what you came up with in Mark before we look into the Gospel of Matthew. So uh, mother of James was there, Salome, Salome, uh, a young man appeared in white robe at the experience of those disciples. Am I going too fast or being too confused? Just no. Oh, don't worry, we'll tell you. I know you will. <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, counting on that. <laughs> um, in all of this, another theme that we came up besides uh, uh, atonement, sacrifices, and again, I thought, why, why is everything so bloody back then? Why did they have to sacrifice animals? What, why was it enough to bring grain or uh, produce? Um, we talked about the Messiah. What, what was that whole idea about? And you know, I printed out three or four pages for myself on just the Messiah. So. Just briefly, this is what it is. Uh, in our English Bible, we're familiar with Jesus Christ. Christ is actually a Greek word, right? Yes. Comes from the Hebrew word, the, what's that? Transliteration of the word Messiah. And the word Messiah simply means anointed. You, that's all it is, the anointed one. Um, you might even think of it, as I did, as simply the baptized one. B-A-P-T-I-Z? Yeah. Baptized one. Baptized with oil, baptized with water. So it's just looking back, it simply means the anointed one of God. And the most common illustration or one of them in the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible is the anointing of the king. The king uh, received a special anointing. So that's kind of what a Messiah is, the, the anointed one appointed by God for leadership and all. Um, but again, using this arrow, it's so much broader and deeper than that, or at least that has become. Let me just take a breath again. Are we okay? 
Great. Yes. So anointed would be kind of synonymous with chosen. Chosen. Uh, no, I mean, anointing means uh, right? if you were chosen uh, as say a prophet, Samuel, uh, as directed by God, uh, chose Saul to be king and anointed him with authority. Mm -hmm. As time went by, the prophet Samuel was told, listen, Sam, by the Lord, I've given up on Saul. Forget him. I'm going to show you the new king, David. And it's a great story. And I'll, now that I'm telling it, um, they are at the battle fighting Goliath. And Samuel knows that Saul's not to be the future leader, but he's been given the idea that, uh, uh, what is uh, David's father's name? I'm forgetting. Anyway, David's father, uh, uh, Saul, <laughs> Samuel has been told that David's father has sons. So they all appear and Samuel looks at these men, oh, that guy, that's got to be the anointed one. And he hears the voice. No, that's not him. Oh, this next son that shows up, that's going to be the chosen one. No, not him. So they go down the list of these sons, brothers of David. And finally, Samuel says to David's father. Where they're not here. He's not here. Do you, do you have any other? Oh, yeah, there's the youngest one. Um. He's out watching the sheep, taking care of the family business because the rest of the boys are here ready to fight. And the Lord whispers to Samuel, wait for him, wait, have him come. And so David finally arrives. He's apparently a young boy, a teenager maybe, no more than a young man, an adolescent. And Samuel hears the voice of God saying, that's the one, he's the one, choose him. And so Samuel recognizes that David is the next chosen one. Am I answering your question at all? David is chosen. He goes through this uh, battle testing with Goliath which we all love the story of David and Goliath, except if you've ever told that story to children, we always end before David chops off Goliath's head. Holds <laughs> it up. Yes. But, well, that's certainly a gruesome part of, of uh, political religious theater that we do not think of often. Mm. Um, but eventually David is anointed king. A long explanation that yeah. maybe doesn't answer any question. Yeah, I just want to know if it's, if it's the same then. Yeah, but you I don't like it. telling it. <laughs> yes, I think it is the same. Mm -hmm. So Messiah was really a political designation. Could be, yes. Had that political and religious implications. So even military. You get an extra. Oh! She's <laughs> kissing up. Judy Ann, I think she's kissing up. I'm not sure. Show that to Joey, you know. Well, we've gotten a long way. We even haven't touched on Matthew yet. So I'm going to refocus now after all of that introductory material to the witness of the resurrection as described in Matthew's gospel. Now, scholars believe that the gospel of Matthew and the gospel of Luke were written about the same time, 80 AD, 90 AD, to two different audiences. Matthew had sent his gospel to an audience that 
a lot of Jewish believers involved, the converts. So he's got one emphasis, and we'll see later that Luke's got another. So here we are picking up Matthew chapter 28, and it could work out pretty well if we went around reading a couple of verses. If you don't want to read, just pass it over to the next person. So I'll begin. I'll actually. Oh, sorry. That, that, uh, introductory music. <laughs> <laughs> It's like music to Star Wars. I'll do uh, <laughs> the first. Sorry, clip. so sorry. Quite all right. <laughs> Matthew chapter 28, verse 1. Jesus is alive. The Sabbath was over, and it was almost daybreak on Sunday when Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to the tomb. Suddenly, a strong earthquake struck, and the Lord's angel came down from heaven. He away the stone and sat on it. The angel looked as bright as lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards shook, with, shook from fear and fell down as though they were dead. Just then, the angel said to the women, do not be afraid. I know you're looking for Jesus, who was nailed to a cross. He isn't here. God has raised him to life, just as Jesus said he would. Come, see the place where his body was lying. Now hurry, tell the disciples that he has been raised to life and is on his way to Galilee. Go there and you will see him. That is what I came to tell you. The women were frightened and yet very happy as they hurried from the tomb and ran to tell the disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them and greeted them. They went near him, held on to his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said, don't be afraid. Tell my followers to go to Galilee. They will see me there. While the women were on the way, some soldier who had been guarding the tomb went into the city. They told the chief priests everything that had happened. So the chief priests met with the leaders and decided to uh, the soldiers with a lot of money. They said to the soldier, tell everyone that Jesus' disciple came during the night, stole his body while you were asleep. If the governor hears about this, we will talk to him. You won't have anything to worry about. The soldier took the money and did what they were told the two Jewish people st still tell each other the story what Jesus followers must do. Jesus' 11 disciples went to the mountain in Galilee, where Jesus had told them to meet him. They saw him and worshiped him, but some of them doubted. Jesus came to them and said, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Go to the people of all nations and make them my disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to do everything I have told you. I will be with you always, even until the end of the world. Great. Thank you. All right. Let's go back and fill in the story with the details of who's taking part in this story. Uh, what's the action that's going on? And, and uh, just get a sense of the flow. So who's involved in the story? Who are the first characters we see? Mary, 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 Mary Magdalene. And the other Mary. Mary so, M. And Mary too. Who's Mary too then? Well. That's not the mother. Is it the mother of Jesus? Well, uh, hey. he doesn't uh, identify Mary hey. number two. Is Do it, you think she's Martha's sister? I'm not going to rule it out, but Matthew doesn't say. Yeah. Is it the same Mary, the mother of James, that Mark mm -hmm. talked about? In our study last week, 
Is it a totally new Mary? We mm -hmm. don't know. So um, there are just two women that Matthew tells are there. Um, is Salome or Salome? Am I saying it right, Justin? From last week, S A L O M E, who was identified in Mark. Is she there again and just not mentioned? Uh, I don't know. Looking at the text, what happens next in Mark in Matthew? Angels, angels, angels. Yeah. an angel. Uh, what little detail? An earthquake. Uh, have we heard about an earthquake before? Mm -hmm. No, the answer is no. Uh, suddenly a strong earthquake in answer to who rolled away the stone? And the, ah, uh, this should be reversed. Mary and Mary too come along, the earthquake. The angel, what does the angel do? Rolls away the stone. What is the angel described like? White. 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 Brilliant. This one gives us white as snow and bright as lightning. Did it even snow in that area of the world? Actually, it does. Uh, Jerusalem is very, uh, at least in the Middle East, it's quite high in a mountainous area. So they do get snow. I don't know that. I thought when Mary Magdalene went to the tomb, yes. he came to her and she said, Ravone, teacher. And she went to touch him and he said not to touch him. Well, Judy Ann, you are getting into the next study already. But it's yeah. great pointing that out because that's some of what we're seeing. Now, this is just not the story that I've always. That's right. This is Matthew's story. Right. Light mid light thing. Is there another N in here? Light lighting. Light me. See, I told you, I get nervous and I can't spell. I can't spell, but I'm not nervous. I was just going to say. So what happens next? Now we've gotten an angel. He's as bright as lightning. Oh, here it is. There is another in in there. And who else is in the story that we didn't hear about last week? That's the soldiers. The soldiers. The Roman soldiers. But it just says guards. Roman guards. Yeah. Yes, you're right. So the guards are there. Okay. What is the dialogue that takes place? Now, is this the only one? Is this the only gospel or the only spot where, where the bribe comes up? That the soldiers go and they're bribed to tell tell a lie. Is that is this the only spot it comes up? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, see, you didn't remember that part, but you remembered the other part about Mary. He comes to the garden. Oh, oh. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> so. We're getting a whole different vision here. Uh, guards are there that become like they're dead, but the, the message is given by not Peter, not Paul, but the angel. And what does the angel say? Don't be afraid. Don't fear. I need to change my color. Angel says, don't fear. What else? I know you are looking for Jesus who was nailed to the cross. He doesn't fear. 
Oh, yeah, I will wait till my followers. That's the great hit uh, in supply. I'm just going to, doesn't say who supplied, but that's what yeah. I'm talking about. So the angel is the one that gives that first of the themes we're looking for. And then what does he say? Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Jesus was nailed to a cross. Verse 6. And he, comes, you came to see where he lays, and go. you're going to tell the disciples that he was raised from the dead. So we've got the second one, verse 6. Not here. Raised. That's the second key we're looking for in all these stories. When does the third key appear in the story? It's going to appear now. It's going to appear there. Well, that's another kind of little detail that uh, at least Mark mentioned. You're not going to see Jesus in Jerusalem. He'll appear to you in Galilee. But in other Gospels, is there an important point that says he's raised just as he said he would be raised? Yeah. That's well, that refers again, you have to know the backstory. Oh, other parts in the Gospel of Matthew, he did say something. Oh, I'm going to have to go to Jerusalem. Uh, uh, I'll have a bad time of it there. I'll be killed. But I'll be raised. Now I have something else to look up during the week. Where does he refer to his impending death in the Gospels? Um, let's read a little further. We're still looking for uh, the third thing and who does it and who says it. Do you see it? Verses eight, nine, ten. Well, Jesus met them. Yeah. Yeah. That's as simple as it is. I'm trying to trick you. Jesus meets them. <clears throat> yeah, and 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 in differentiation in this gospel, he allows them to touch him. Yeah. Another one he said not to. Yeah. Jesus meets him. So he appears to them, and there's key number three. So if you think back to what we've been studying, the Apostle Paul gave it one, two, three. Oh, Jesus was crucified, dead, and they buried him. But then he appeared, and he rattled, uh, but then God raised him. And then he appeared to Peter and Paul and, and James and John and 500 people. And then he finally appeared to me. So he just boom, boom, boom. He doesn't mention the women or he doesn't say anything about the stone. He just gives us. And then when we get to Peter, Peter does basically the same thing. Talks about. Oh, you know, you know the story. Jesus was crucified and buried. Uh, but by God's power, he was raised. Doesn't talk about angels. Doesn't talk about earthquakes. And you start, what is going on here? So then last week we saw Mark. Mark mentions all of this. He tells uh, them to go to Galilee too, but he mentions different women. He mentions an angel, but doesn't say he's white as snow or bright as lightning, gives a little bit of a different twist. No earthquake in Mark. He no talk, he guards. Talked more about the emotions. Yeah, we did see that. We saw that there was a lot of talk about. Uh, fear and anxiety. What else do you, issues do you see? Questions does it raise? Well, for me, 
uh, the ninth verse here. Uh, they went near him, held on to his feet. That doesn't mention that. In, no, that's uh, right. In uh, contrast to what Judy Ann said in, in another gospel that we'll look at, when Mary met Jesus. Hey, don't touch me. Don't touch me. He said. I haven't ascended yet. I think. Yeah, but here, the little detail is different. Hmm. So scholars and people over the course of centuries, what, what is the difference? Why? What perspective did they have? Are they just repeating something? They heard something? Uh, how close of uh, eyewitness were they? Uh, perspective is a great word yeah. with the Gospels and with uh, Peter's uh -huh. writings, because Peter doesn't do a great job of, for the most part, of giving women any benefit for a lot of things <laughs> where the other gospels do. Uh-huh. You mentioned 500 people that he where where did you get that from? In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that's where uh, I'm referring back to one of our first studies. Um 1 Corinthians if I'll just kind of summarize Paul says, for I handed on to you as of first importance what in turn I had received. Christ died for our sins, according to the scripture. He was buried and he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. And he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. And then verse six, he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time. Then he appeared to James, and then he appears also to me. None of that is in the gospel story. Mm -hmm. and you would think what was so important for Paul to mention it. Why don't these other guys mention it? Perspective. Perspective. I like that. Yeah. Maybe I'll even try to spell. <laughs> You got it. You got it. Yes. But not, none of them witnessed this themselves. So they heard the story, correct, from different people. Say or? a little bit more about who didn't witness it. Um, like Matthew and Mark. Uh -huh. I mean, they weren't there right, right at that moment. We are the tomb right and yeah. the whole thing that's a nice insight and so they heard the story from someone else uh -huh. you know how stories can i yes. just going to say that yeah put people in a room in a circle and tell <laughs> like telephone yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. and also time so this was written way after it uh, all took place yeah matthew could have been written 60 years after all of this took place and um, Mark wasn't a disciple. He wasn't one of the 12. Um, I think some of the scholars think the gospel of Mark, if it was Mark, he was a protege of Paul. And is this Matthew that we're reading today? The Matthew that was the disciple, the tax collector? Or was it Someone that came after him and used his name. Uh, strict, orthodox, biblical understanding would say, of course it's the disciple. But I'll leave that up in the air. Yeah, Amy. When did, um, what is it, doubting? Tom. Thomas. I thought it was Tom. I didn't want to say. <laughs> when did he do that and like stick his hands in the... In a, you know, stick his finger in his hand or whatever to, you know, what, what, what? I think in Galilee, I think. When, he when was that Galilee, kind of during this whole thing? In Jerusalem. Oh, really? Okay. In an oh, upper room. room. In a room. I remember that. Um, so if it's not in the Gospel of Matthew, it has to be in the Gospel of Luke or John. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. Um, that's the only one that says that. So there's only one time that it says about that. The, yeah, the gospel actually has the most 
common oh no. but solo incidences at all four. Uh -huh. Okay, no. thank you. That's where you're drawn from, Mom. That's, mm -hmm. I think, you're drawn from Luke. Yeah, you're going to get the story you want next week. <laughs> so, I mean, <laughs> you have to come next week. So, look, that um, must be the most popular one, though, because that's the one I was always taught. What's uh -huh. the most? Which, 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 what are you talking Which one's the, the most? The one about her going there, him, her calling him Rabone, when she realizes he, she doesn't realize who he is. And then when she realizes, she says Rabone, which means teacher. And okay. she goes to touch him and he tells her she can't touch him, but he hasn't yet ascended, I think. Uh -huh. what he said. Good. But I mean, that was taught to me. It's the only one I Absolutely. ever heard in Sunday school. Hmm. And that's this I illustration, I believe, of what happens to us at Christmas time. Yeah. You know, if you think back, in our Christmas stories, in our pageants, it always is the angel comes to Mary, the angel comes to Joseph, the angel shows up and tells the shepherds, and then uh, after the shepherds, the three kings arrive. But if you read the stories, Matthew and Luke are the only two that tell the story. Mm -hmm. tells the story of the shepherds. The other tells the story of the kings. We really don't know if they ever met. And where did the kings arrive? Some feel that Jesus could have been two, three, five years old, maybe five mm -hmm. old right. when the kings arrived. Mm -hmm. But we've integrated them or conflated them in our storytelling in our churches. Oh, and conflate? I like that. Yeah. Oh, another one I'll have to put. <laughs> I don't know what that word means. Conflated <laughs> means just melded, yeah. combined, together, joined. Okay. okay, thank you. Combined combination. You know, uh, story like using my fingers, Amy, the story Matthew tells and the story of Luke tells or intertwine and you can't tell where one starts and where one begins. Well, yeah, yeah. Okay. So mm -hmm. um, I guess this brings up the question. Are these details important? Yeah. Why would Matthew right. think it was important that his audience hear about the earthquake, the Roman guards being put to sleep and being bribed. Was there a purpose to that? It's a narrative to tell a story. Uh huh. Was well, there sometimes also, you know how when you pray and you may, God, you say, the Lord spoke to me and people think, oh, he spoke to you and you heard his voice. But it may not be a voice. Mm -hmm. It may be a glow or it may be a warm feeling, and the words come to you. You know, you have people that tell you that, that when they, they went to heaven and saw heaven, yeah. you know? Yeah. It's like Peter said, perspective. This is uh -huh. what those words did to you, and that's your lesson from those words. How true. Um, so there must have been a point Again, in, in scholarship, they think these, these men, they believe they're all men that wrote the Gospels, were inspired by God, that these words are authoritative and without error. So there must have been a purpose, a, a lesson that someone that's reading this or listening to this thinks, oh, yeah, that's really great. That's Oh, now I understand it. I think mm -hmm. that's it. It's the narrative part of yeah. it. It's the way to be able to, for someone to speak the story and not just say, hey, you saw a flash of light, bang, he went. Mm -hmm. Right. This is the story so that people can really feel it. Uh-huh. And when you when you hear the narrative and you hear the part of it, you hear the you know the earthquaking and all of a yeah. sudden the light and all those kind of things. Uh-huh. Then a receiver of the story. Can visualize it wherever you just said, "Hey, boom!" He, he just left. I think it's a different. That's right. Hard to understand. 
it, it drives the nor narrative or the story uh, ahead and maybe makes it more comprehensible that you'll you'll remember it. Yes. Uh, you can almost think of it as like a little kid listening, oh, Matthew, Matthew, um, yep. who rolled the stone away? Uh, I don't know who rolled it. And Matthew is saying, oh, uh, that's right. Oh, yeah, it was an angel. Uh, I kind of remember. Mm -hmm. Did you have a question? No, I was just running things through my mind. Good. Uh, the, if you want to know what it is, it's just that um, these are the uh, gospels that were chosen by basically the Catholic people that made up the Bible. They left out some of what they call the goth, goth, goth. Gnostics. Gnostics. And like even the Catholic Bible has a St. Joseph's uh, chapter where we don't have it. So there's so much more that we could pull from, but uh -huh. we don't have a available. Oh. That could be a whole other Bible study. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. That's a, things have got wider. <laughs> you brought up so many uh, things. I just started thinking, oh, we'll so, have fun looking at these <laughs> three uh, emphasis. Sorry. Just Justin, just you want to add some good things? <laughs> so um, I guess it's kind of bringing it back to this, the how I perceive a lot of these um, these kind of variations in the narrative is also just really what the socio-political climate was at that time. You know, recognizing that in verse four, it's the guard shook from fear and fell down as though they were dead. And this is not even from an appearance of God, but it's an angel of God. So this is like even something that to speak to that power. And then again, speaking to the power, I mean, it's taking um, a good, you know, a good, portion of this time speaking about the Roman guards or the soldiers. So I think that um, it's really critical to understand that that's why there's so much variation is because it's almost like people talking on different islands and realizing that the there's a lot of Roman occupation for the people that Matthew were talking to. So therefore, he's going to kind of show more of a striking down of the government as this is a political statement of yeah. Jesus's resurrection because that is the true king, even though they're still fighting against the powers that are in existence, which, are, which is the Roman king or the Roman emperor. Well, I, Justin, great. I think that reminded me that all of this is written, Matthew and Luke at least, after the Romans have destroyed Jerusalem. Yeah. The Roman legions uh, were putting down a rebellion, and somewhere around the year 70, they besieged Jerusalem and smashed into the city, destroyed the walls, pulled down the temple, just knocked everything to schmitherines as an occupying army like we're seeing in the Ukraine, being, oh, yes. city being leveled uh -huh. and the people being carted off. So to Justin's point, Matthew was saying to, to all of those, let's say all of those Ukrainian refugees, hey, listen, back in the day, God's angels came and and knocked down all those soldiers that they were trying to guard uh, Jesus' body, and God's angels and spirit came and resurrected Jesus. God is the real power here. Even the Roman guards couldn't stand up against them. Take heart. Be of good courage. Don't fear. And so I think that's kind of getting to the sense in the people that are hearing this. Maybe they're refugees in Syria, what is now Syria, or Lebanon, or Turkey. Oh, yeah, God. Oh, yeah, our God is an awesome God. Mm. So, mm, boy, I'm getting carried away. <laughs> Matthew, Matthew was... Uh, oh, hold, on, uh, was hold on a second, Mary. The entire New Testament was written after the Romans destroyed Jerusalem? Uh, the not the whole, just the Gospels at least. Yeah. Uh, 
all, all of Paul's letters were written before the, like the year 50, 60. Paul is dead before Jerusalem is destroyed. So all his writings is prior to the destruction of Jerusalem. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the book of Revelation, all comes years after that. And uh, after the year 70, there was really no more Israel. It's mm -hmm. occupied wasteland. The Jewish people are being dispersed around the known world at the time. Yeah. Mary Ann. Mary Ann. Um, I just want to mention um, the Gospel of Matthew. He was Jewish and he he wrote uh, to the Jewish people and as as um, that Jesus was the Messiah. And Mark, of course, was Roman. He wrote to the Romans. Is that correct? Well, his gospel. I, I can go along with that. Mark was uh, a Jewish Roman boy. So right. Writing to mostly converts. Right. Both. But his gospel was written mostly to uh, all his the Jewish people. Is that true? I mean, I, I'm. Well, most I, of the early church were. Jewish converts. Jewish, right. Uh, they weren't even converts because for decades, oh, yes. what we call the church was just a part of Judaism, like the Sadducees and the Pharisees right. and the Essenes and the followers of the way. They mm -hmm. were just one of several mm -hmm. acceptable Jewish alternatives at the time. Amy. Well, I feel like it's any like everything else in today's world it's like there's levels of all different types yes. of jewish people all different types of christian people yep. and um <clears throat> the pharisees weren't probably the same as but i know now i understand now more because i i always i always heard like you know growing up myself being jewish it was always more of like you know um uh how untrue like Jesus is or that he came back and you know all that stuff and that was more to me like the concept of the Pharisees storyline mm -hmm. versus mm -hmm. other people's storylines mm -hmm. and it's sad though because a lot of some people it seems like um, especially when the Passion of Christ came out that yes. there was and and Mel Gibson kind of said something when he was intoxicated and blaming the Jewish people oh, yes I think he meant to say it was the Pharisees versus the right. Jewish people that's and right came out the Jewish people I, mean, I think a lot of possibly, you know, the Jewish uh -huh. community took it very to heart and that, right. that conflict came in. But I'm glad that I've learned over the years. It's not, it's just like anything else in this world. It's a mm -hmm. part of the culture. Yes. It's not the whole culture. So I'm really happy over the years. I finally learned yes. that versus the whole community of the Jewish versus the Pharisees. Absolutely. It was it took a long time for me Jewish to comprehend that. That crucified Jesus. It was a collaboration uh, mm -hmm. of uh, the religious and the political mm -hmm. leaders, the right. government with That's right. leaders, a small minority, but a powerful one. Yes. That drove the story forward. Unfortunately, we've Bill, gone over 2,000 years and it's still about the politics. Yeah. Bill, right. I have right. a question in, uh, in Matthew. I think it's uh, 28, 18, it says, when the, uh, so Jesus came to them and said, now the then here are the, are, the, are the 11 disciples in Galilee. He came to them and said, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. And what the heck is all authority? Uh-huh. Well, I'm oh. glad you brought up that because as we're, now I see where you got the clock from. <laughs> I have to replace that one, but I, I think it's important to pastor as a clock to look at in the uh, in the sanctuary. Thank you. <laughs> um, just to wind up now with the last uh, four verses, um, Jesus, eleven disciples, went to a mountain in Galilee. So we've got a whole change of venue. We're we're leaving Jerusalem. Uh, the disciples have made this long trek up north 
into Galilee? Uh, is it the same mountain where the transfiguration took place or some other, just a mountain, it's not even said. They go up to Galilee and that's where the disciples see Jesus. And it's reported by Matthew that he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Or I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. This is called the Great Commission. And in the scope of the church history, this becomes go to the people of all nations and make them my disciples. Uh, all authority in heaven and on earth is sort of a religious uh, theme or designation uh, that Jesus is part of God who has authority in the vast expanses of heaven and the great depths of earth. So it's uh, an all-encompassing phrase uh, to show uh, God's command of the heaven and earth. Again, to pick up on Justin's point, it ain't the Roman emperor that right. <laughs> heaven and earth. Right. Augustus, uh, Nero, Putin. Caligula, <laughs> Diocletian, uh, Constantine. These men are not Trump. gods. They do not control heaven and earth. Uh, Jesus Christ, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit controls heaven and earth. But Constantine is the one that brought Christianity to Rome, though, right? Well, he's reported to be the one that uh, made uh, everyone Christian by converting himself on his deathbed, though, yeah. maybe. Yeah. And once the king was Christian, everybody. Well, <clears throat> for me, I'm looking at Matthew 28, 16 and 17, and it talks about the 11 disciples went up to the gallery, uh, mountain in Galilee, and Jesus met them there. They worshiped him, but it's so mind boggling me that you're telling me these are the 11 disciples that followed him and was educated about him and the knowledge and all the things that were told to him about coming back. And then, but you still have yeah. some of them doubted. Yeah. That's what I said. So uh -huh. like you're talking about 11 disciples that were following doubted. How can we not expect the whole world to have doubts? Mm -hmm. If you had 11 disciples that saw him after he passed away and came back. Yeah. I mean, been with them it's been time. with him and followed him and believed in him. So it, it just shows you that, that I guess our human great. side yeah. of just having. I could see yeah. this in this way. I think that they did do and love Jesus and the whole thing, but they were so distraught in their hearts and minds because they knew what was coming with the fear of what might have happened to everything. Mm -hmm. And I see it too with our politics and things. I think a lot of times like when they know that something's going to happen with the one country invades another country and you see that when you heard here, they, it was told it was going to, things were going to happen and mm -hmm. people like, their lives going and not believing it and not seeing it going to happen uh -huh. and just the fear the, the I see it you know, fear and anxiety yeah. what do you say about anxiety that's a future I like that future when you said that as opposed to depression which is I like that a lot that's why uh, what Justin said in the sermon was good when he said you have to be grateful and have those affirmations. You keep your eye on him. If Even when I feel a little anxious and I just say his name, it stops you. And then you try to recall a verse, that feeling that comes over you because it's live. And they just found something that's older than the Bible. I can, please forgive me, I can't remember the name of it, but it's only two centimeters big, two centimeters wide. And they said the man who um, scribed it with lead on the parchment 
was genius and um, the religious archeologic, uh, archeological experts are um, studying it more so they could tell more people about it. So you know these words are true and live and have really, really happened. It wasn't just yesterday. Thanks. Well, our time is about up and uh, oh. you've exhausted me again. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. Um, I hope you'll be back if you want to take another bookmark as a, a sign that you've now endured four classes. <laughs> uh, looking again, if you want to read ahead, uh, you're welcome to. Uh, we're going into Luke. April. Next week, we're doing uh, Luke chapter Six. 24. Oh. And we're looking at verses 1 through 12 and 13 through 35. And we may take a look at Acts. Uh, I'll write them up here on the board. Oh. Here. Yeah. Yeah. 1 through 12. That's April 2nd. April, is it the 2nd? or? Yeah. Is it the second or the third? Yeah. No, it's the third. It's Everything's the third. written everywhere else, right? <laughs> it's written it's, right Yeah, the it's third. Oh, it yeah. It's always written everywhere. We always ask. <laughs> no, don't be sorry. I do the exact same right thing. I don't know how much time we'll have to get into. Why not? Acts. It's believed that the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts are were written by the same person and they've gotten separated but they were like book one and book two of the same story so uh, i quoted something from acts here and that's for april yeah april was that acts four i can't read, can't read the board acts four Acts 10, 34 to 41. Right in the bulletin. I can't see it from the Zoom. Oh, the I, bulletin is not Amy see, said it's in anything. the bulletin. Yeah, but she's not. And Justin will have it up momentarily. Up. Okay. <laughs> Acts 10. It's already on the website. <laughs> it's on the website, uh, Miriam. Oh, okay. It's that interaction yeah. sometimes <laughs> with our phones. Yes. Yeah, you get things you. accomplished. What's the scoop on Eli? I'm like that too, Justin. If I get it done now, I will have to think about it. God bless you. Take a pen if you need a pen to go. And I'll see you next week. I thought he said it. I feel better now. I'm like, Will's birthday. He lives in Las Vegas. Oh, nice. Another wonderful class. Good. Uh, can I just say something? It's Marianne. Hi, you still there? I got to go.